Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a restful weekend and enjoyed some uh, nice weather uh, briefly outside or uh, some other wonderful manifestation of that. Uh, I wanted to start off today uh, catching up on a little bit of um, uh, logistical points and then move on back into uh, some of the stuff that's on our mind. Uh, a few logistics. We're back into the homework cycle, having finished our midterm. Uh, homework 4 is going to be due on Friday at 5. I've posted homework 5, which is due next Friday at 5. And then you should have also been able to access your midterm 1 scores. Uh, the median grade on the midterm was a 60%, 60 and change uh, there, which is uh, a little bit lower than I expected. And I think that's because of the nature of the extension question that I asked, um, which was about combining uh, fluxes from multiple sources to evaluate a magnitude, if you know the magnitudes. Uh, so I put this on here because I wanted to sort of see if you were successfully generalizing the concepts of the relationship between magnitudes and fluxes, and I think it was more challenging than I expected. Uh, so I am going to, you can look forward to seeing a problem like problem one on the midterm on a future evaluation, likely a final exam. So uh, fair warning that that will probably come back and see if you have picked it up after this learning experience. Um, other than that, I thought the performance on a lot of the content was excellent. Uh, the sort of multiple choice section went very well for a lot of people. And then the second question about do, uh, evaluating observations uh, and sort of doing some flux and inverse square law and projected area conversions, which were much more kind of like, they're much more sort of repetitions of what we had seen in class. That went pretty well for everybody. Um, just a reminder that the midterm is subject to the ACE clause. So if you were sort of a little shaky here and or had a bad day or didn't realize the multiple choice section was sequential. Uh, that kind of stuff can be overwritten when you get to the final exam and just get a higher score than your midterm. That will The final exam score will just straight up replace the midterm in your uh, average. Um, if no questions asked, if it's bigger, I stick it into your average that way. Uh, so there's always a chance of redemption here as we move forward. Uh, that's kind of what I had to say about the midterm solutions posted and if you go into your attempt on the multiple choice section there should be explanations for all the multiple choice questions that you got uh, but if you had any questions for me that were sort of more general uh, let me uh, go ahead and let me know Okay, I'm not seeing any signs of typing or anything like that. So we'll move on back into content. So today we're going to wrap up stellar populations and hopefully transition into the study of the interstellar medium, uh, which should get us to where we you know, hopefully will uh, uh, get all of the pieces we need for understanding a galaxy. And then we'll start to put them together and discuss how they all interact to understand galaxy evolution as a whole. And then it'll be April and we'll be done with the course. But uh, the basics of this are to wrap up what goes into the re notion of real stellar populations. So before the midterm, we were exploring the idea of how do we understand a stellar population in the actual Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for uh, Gaia, and here we kind of came up with three main effects that we needed to worry about. We've covered biases. We went into sort of a detailed uh, study of dust and extinction, mostly because I need to leverage those ideas of cross-section and mean-free path throughout the rest of the course. Uh, but this brings up uh, part of the, you know, exploding watermelons turn out to be important for many other reasons. And then uh, we'll also talk about actual star formation history histories a bit today. So the reason why dust is important is it extinguishes the light, so it makes stars appear fainter than they are because there's this junk in the way that kind of blocks out the light and keeps you from being able to see uh, the stars behind it as effectively, reducing their brightness, increasing their magnitudes. Uh, but the effect of dust is different on different light. 
uh, and it depends on the wavelength of the light that's being observed. Uh, and that's because the magnitudes of extinction that is suffered by uh, a uh, star is higher if the wavelength of light is shorter. So basically, this is the mathematical to mathematicalization of the uh, phenomenon I told you earlier, which is that dust debluens light or reddens uh, starlight. And that just means uh, now mechanically, it means that the cross section for uh, scattering and absorption scale inversely with the wavelength of the light. So the absorption it scatters like one over lambda, uh, so that's how it will block light, and that's just the sort of electromagnetic interaction with these weird fluffy dust grains, and then it scatters light with a proportional to wavelength to the fourth power. Uh, this is this wavelength to the fourth power inverse power of wavelength to the fourth. Uh, that should be familiar if you've seen the phenomenon of Rayleigh scattering in any of your classes. It's why the sky is blue is this particular scaling. Uh, but this is part of a more general case of scattering uh, for dielectric spheres, uh, for dust grains that's called me scattering. And I'm almost positive you wouldn't encounter that in our optics class. But if you go on in physics into like Phys 524 and other excellent, excellent classes, you start to encounter these advanced forms of scaling and deriving these relationships. For us here today, all you have to know is that wavelengths, uh, as the wavelength gets shorter, the cross section gets larger, and this leads to the phenomenon of reddening. Uh, practically, uh, what that means is that we can compare the extinctions in one uh, band of the light uh, here in one filter set uh, to the uh, extinctions in others. And this gives us this phenomenon that we call the reddening curve. And the graph of the reddening curve is shown here. This is one of the classic studies about the reddening curve. And reddening for historical reasons is almost always referenced to this Johnson Cousins V band, which has a sort of peak wavelength uh, or a peak uh, reception wavelength at about 550 nanometers. So that's, you know, solid yellow light right there that's the visible band and we estimate we describe the reddening properties of dust in terms of this weird little coefficient called r sub v which is the magnitudes of extinction at v band compared to the difference in magnitudes of extinction between the Johnson Cousins B band and then the V band. And I've labeled in this diagram here uh, the V band with one point and the B band in the next point. And this is basically getting at what the slope of the reddening curve is. And you'll notice that this line is fairly steady and it's showing you the graph of three separate environments. Um, the Milky Way is kind of the dash dotted line, I guess four separate environments, two parts of the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud. And it shows that in the ultraviolet portion of the spectrum, that's the section of the graph over on the right, uh, it's graphed in this one over wavelength unit, so that's basically increasing frequency as you go from left to right, you get different values of the extinction relative to the V-band extinction here. But in the optical section, which is kind of down there in the corner, uh, the slope of that curve is pretty steady. And so we use this reddening value. But we often describe this reddening value uh, in terms of the properties of dust. And the reason why these four different environments are important is the large Magellanic Cloud and the small Magellanic Cloud are much lower metallicities. These are dwarf galaxy systems around the Milky Way, and so they haven't evolved as much as the Milky Way. Their metallicities are lower, and their dust is different, which leads to different extinction properties, something that we'll be sort of aware of when we think about the emergent light from galaxies of different types as we move on later in the course. The effect of this uh, reddening is also quite visible in the Gaia data. Uh, the Gaia hertzsprung russell diagram that we've been looking at has actually been filtered for cases where the color excess the, uh, has been is very small, which basically translates into having low dust extinction. Uh, in the Gaia HR diagram, we can calculate a reddening coefficient, which is the reddening coefficient at the Gaia G band compared to the difference between the B and 
and the R bands, and you find out that that's about a 1.8, a uh, value of 1.8. And what this really uh, gives us is it gives us the slope of what's sometimes called the reddening vector in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And I've drawn in cyan here this nice little reddening vector illustrating uh, how the effects of dust extinction are kind of smearing out uh, these features in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And by filtering this to low extinctions, everything kind of sharpens up very nicely. But the effects when we look out and we look at all the stars without filtering it, you get the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that you see here, and you get these long streaks here. And the slope of that vector is about 1.8. So if I have one magnitude in color change, uh, or I should say this, if I have 1.8 magnitudes in uh, G-band extinction, that also shifts my color to the right by one magnitude. And so what that gives me is uh, everything gets kind of stretched out along this line. And if you look at the feature of the red clump there, that little piece uh, right there, it's kind of smeared out in the direction parallel to the reddening vector. So all of the features in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram with ext uh, behind extinction screens here will be moved down and to the right. And so you'll be able to determine uh, the properties of stars by looking at these reddening if you know where they are. And doing this with just like two or three bands is kind of tricky uh, to actually figure out the intrinsic colors and properties of stars and the uh, reddening. Uh, so what people actually tend to do is look at four or five different bands and then they can back out independently where the star is and the amount of extinction uh, that's there. So a lot of the dereddening uh, we see in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is doing this kind of multi-band analysis. Yep. All right. Uh, is there any questions on that? All right. So. Uh, I wanted to show you this, which is a graph of what uh, it's a it's kind of a volume rendering study of people who've been examining Gaia data in conjunction with these multi uh, band studies, uh, in particular, a survey called PanStars, uh, which uh, took images and spectra of a bunch of stars across uh, the, the sky, uh, they have then paired with the parallax information from Gaia. And what they do here is they're mapping out where there is dust along the line of sight. And you can do this by looking out along the line of sight and basically counting up the amount of extinction to stars at different distances. And if I look farther, and the difference between the cumulative extinction uh, gives me kind of the extinction along the line of sight uh, there. So if I look at one star and it's a tenth of a magnitude more extinguished than a nearby star, and those stars are 10 parsecs in between, you know that tenth of a magnitude of extinction has to lie between those two stars. And that's the reasoning of what you see here, where they've made this kind of three-dimensional map of where the dust is in the galaxy. And this is actually a movie, which is a little bit, um, I don't know, sort of, it, it may be vaguely nausea-inducing, for which I apologize. But it gives you this kind of, by sort of doing this animation, it gives you this kind Kind of parallax view of what the uh, dust structures look like in our galaxy. And so this is something that's really come along in the past three or four years where people are mapping out where the dust is in the galaxy and mapping out three-dimensional maps of uh, the clouds that are harboring it. Uh, this uh, cloud you see on the left is uh, the Orion molecular cloud, which is one of the nearest sites of high mass star formation. And now we can kind of see this all in three dimensions. All right. Um, yeah. So I just wanted to illustrate that. So the other piece of non-ideal Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams that I wanted to mention today uh, was this notion of star formation histories. Uh, and the Goal in an analyzing an Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is to understand where all the stars are and why there are the number of stars at a position in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram that aren't, yeah, you know, that, you know, 
why are that there? Why are that many stars there at that point in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram? And we argued last week that part of that was due to biases. You see the stars that are bright more readily than you see the stars that are faint, and so you'll get a different number of stars in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram at different locations. But part of that density, we kind of kicked the can down the road. It says it had to do with the history of star formation. Uh, in an environment. And so this is uh, parameterized in terms of this thing that's called the star formation rate. It's often denoted SFR, or it's, I'd use this little dot, uh, which is Newtonian calculus notation, uh, for the time rate of change of the stellar mass, which is the star formation rate. And uh, from our kind of reasoning, we can sort of walk out that the number of stars on the main sequence at a given mass here, I'm going to switch to this here. Is uh, can be expressed in terms of the number uh, the number change rate of uh, stars. So basically, I can figure out the number of stars on uh, the main sequence as the integral of basically the rate at which I add stars to the system uh, over time, and then I'm going to have F M here. And what that FM indicates is the fraction of stars at that mass, so in a given mass interval. So if I want to find out the number of stars in a mass interval, it's the fraction of stars in that mass interval uh, times this integral over the uh, time rate of change of stars. So it's basically if I'm adding stars at a certain rate, like 10 stars per year, and I integrate over 100 years, I would get 1,000 stars. That's giving me, that's basically the math that's encompassed in here. Uh, the trick with this is that that stop time, kind of up here, uh, that I'm using here as the upper bound of the integral, is one of two choices. It's either the main sequence lifetime of a given star, or the age of the universe, whichever is shorter. And the reason is, is that uh, if I'm building up stars, uh, again, using my analogy, at a rate of 10 per year, 400 years, and the main sequence lifetime of those stars is 50 years, uh, then what happens is I don't see the stars that were formed between 50 and 100 mega years ago because they're no longer on the main sequence. So this is basically we have to look back uh, in time to a certain point. And this is the magic of this thing is that by looking at stars of different masses, we can probe different look back times in a galaxy uh, because they evolve at different rates. Now, we don't typically count numbers of stars exactly, or the physical parameters that describe the stars are more in terms of the mass than they are in terms of the number. And so what we see is that we can take the star formation rate and divide this by the average mass of a star, which you are calculating on this homework assignment for homework four. Uh, so you're figuring out what's the typical mass of the star here. And this is kind of the analogy is I asked you to calculate the supernova remnant rate in uh, the, that homework assignment. And so this is very, very analogous reasoning where I can calculate the, star, the mass star formation rate and divide by the average mass of a star to figure out the total mass of the star. And then FM is the number fraction of those in a given mass interval. So this is just a plausible argument that by kind of probing we can look at the number we can predict the number of stars on the main sequence based on the star formation rate and properties that are dictated by the initial mass function so that's the fm and the average mass of a star and then you can know a bit about stellar evolution and that'll tell you about M, uh, t stop so all of these pieces are things that we can predict except for the star formation rate and we can, if we count the number of stars, that means we can kind of invert this integral and come up with what the star formation rate is. So I'm going to only give you a couple of pieces. And on homework five, there's a little bit of a plausibility argument to sort of work through what the heck I am talking about here. But I want to give you a couple pieces to get introduced to that in this ePoll question. So ePoll code is LUW. And I'm going to ask you to look for a Saul-Peter IMF about what is the ratio of mass of stars found with masses between 0.79 and 0.81 solar masses 
compared to the total number of stars with masses between 1.99 and 2.01 solar masses. And this would be without taking into account any of the stopping times for this particular integral. And I'm going to set you up a little bit because this is a weird question to ask and I've sort of asked it in a different way. Uh, but reflecting back on how we figured out uh, the mass for a given star, a set of stars, we know that for a stellar population, that the star mass uh, is equal to the integral of dn by dm, uh, dn, dn by d fancy m uh, times the mass of those stars, m, times a differential amount of mass, dm. And we need to go from the lower bound to the upper bound of these mass integrals. And that's the answer that I want here. So this is sort of set up, and, and then I want, uh, this is sort of set up to carry out this integral easier than what you are having to do on homework four because of this tiny little interval in total mass ranges. So here I can substitute in the Saul-Peter IMF, and I get uh, practically that this is 0.79 uh, to 0 0.81 in terms of non-dimensionalized units, remembering that fancy m is m over the solar mass here, uh, times dn, dm, which is c star, times m to the minus 2.35, times that mass, times dm. And I'm going to note that we can approximate this integral as c star times m to the minus 1.35, times delta m because the value is a tiny interval so they we're just going to use the rectangle approximation to the integrand uh, or to the integral and so then we have m is 0 0.8 that's what's right in the middle and then delta m is going to be 0 0.02 so what I'd like for you to do is calculate the ratio of the masses of m star between 0 0.79 to m over m sun less than 0 0.81. And I want you to divide that by m star to the 1.99 less than m over m star sun less than 2.01. All right, so this should give you a little bit of a setup. I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to press the go button on the ratio of masses. So if you've been not listening to me and calculating, you can punch in a number. If you have any questions about the setup, uh, go ahead and throw them in the Discord or into chat or unmute and ask, remembering that things that you say won't be recorded. Ah. Uh, Question came up, how did we get 0 0.8? Well, this is, uh, the, this is the interval here, 0 0.79 to 0 0.81. When I'm doing the rectangle approximation, I pick the value in the middle, which is clear, set up to be 0 0.80 with 0 0.01 on either side. Uh, question, go ahead. Uh, sure. Yep. 
Yeah, yeah. So this, I, it, it's good to note that this uh, star formation rate is in units of solar masses per year, usually. Yeah. No problem. All right, so I'm gonna try to carry on with my setup um, here. All right, so if I go ahead and set this up, I stick in the 0 0.8 as the midpoint for the interval for the top mass range here. Uh, so I stick in 0 0.8, and then for the mass interval here, uh, I pick the point in the middle, which is set up to be 2.0. And then I put in this rectangle approximation to uh, the integration of the IMF, and so I guess C star and a delta M, but both of these cases, C star is unknown, but it's the same for this stellar population. So I can cancel that out. And then the delta M is set up to be 0.02 in each interval. So that cancels out. And then we get this as 0.8 over two to the minus 1.35, and that's equal to 3.44, four, four, five. There we go. So there, that allows us to calculate the mass interval uh, or the ratio of the masses in these two separate intervals. And so if we went through this and saw that the mass interval was actually going to be um, larger than this, say there were five times as much mass in these low mass stars as these high mass stars, uh, that's telling us something about the star formation rate that happened between the main sequence interval of the uh, lifetime of the low mass stars, which would be longer than the age of the universe, and the main sequence lifetime of these high mass stars, which is going to be like one, ten, one gig year, so a tenth of the age of the universe or so. So it's telling us something that happened, the star formation rate that happened in that interval between one gig year ago and 14 gig years ago. And it gives us some sense of that. And by looking at a bunch of different masses, we can back out what the star formation rate uh, uh, over time is. So let's see how we did here. Whoop. Hey, it's a number. I love it all. Chef's kiss. Delightful. Okay, closing, any questions there? Cool, cool. All right. Um, yeah, I think I need to switch back to slides for this. All right, uh, so the next thing I want to show you is this exact technique applied uh, so, okay, sorry, going back. Um, there was a question. This is the ratio of the average masses. Uh, this is the ratio of masses uh, between, uh, this is the ratio of stellar mass found in stars in this mass interval, 0 0.79 uh, to 0 0.81, compared to the mass that's found in stars with that. Uh, mass interval. So it's basically saying that there's three times as much mass located in these lower mass stars than there is in these higher mass stars. And I could pick different mass intervals and that ratio would change. And then what I'm really doing is I'm comparing the mass interval that I observe or the mass ranges that I observe to the values that we expect for the initial mass functions and then using the knowledge of the initial mass function and the um, stellar 
evolution timescales to figure out what the star formation history is. But the mass that we are calculating for a particular interval is the average mass in that interval. Now, it's the amount of mass, total amount of mass that is found in the stellar population that is organized into stars of that mass, uh, of a given mass of two solar masses versus 0.8 solar masses. So this is the, like, this is basically, if you add up all these stars, you get that. We could also do this by number and ask, what's the number of stars that are found at 0.8 versus the number of stars that are found at two? And we would then calculate this exact same thing without this uh, uh, M there. So this is, you know, it's just a different calculation, and this is just asking what's the mass in the system in, organized into stars of that. So that's the, okay. All right, um, so I want to show you how this process actually plays out in real life. Uh, this is the panchromatic uh, Hubble Andromeda Treasury. I don't know why the, uh, oh, because I put the title on and I forgot Hubble. So it's called FAT. Uh, this is the study, uh, uh, this is the study. I, I actually get to participate in the uh, panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury Triangulum Extension Region Survey, which is called FATTER, um, which studies M33 and is only hilarious because of the name. Uh, but what this does is this is a huge Hubble survey of a chunk of the galaxy, of the chunk of our nearest, uh, I think, yes, yeah, the nearest massive spiral galaxy to our own uh, called Andromeda. It's part of this local group of galaxies that we'll discuss it a lot more later. And what they've done here is they've basically imaged this, and Hubble is our highest resolution, best quality optical imager. And it's the highest resolution, not because of the dish uh, or the size of the aperture, but because it's in space. And so it's free from the distorting and blurring effects of the ground-based sink. So it has excellent uh, angular resolution here. And so it can resolve individual stars in distant galaxies or like Andromeda. And this is what you see here. And I picked this uh, particular highlight image, which shows you the overview of the entire region on the top. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. That's the actual Hubble data. And every one of those little sort of squares that you see, the rectangles around the edge, that's kind of giving you the size and shape of the camera that they're using to tile this. So this is a mosaic where they basically pointed the uh, telescope across this huge ch uh, chunk of the galaxy. And it took... I forget how many orbits, but like lots and lots of time. I think it's in the order of a thousand orbits to uh, take these images in the most efficient way possible, which is a massive amount of Hubble time. This is one of the largest projects that was executed uh, on the uh, on the telescope. Um, so what they've done uh, is they build up this massive mosaic and these little uh, snapshots that you see, uh, the inlays here is kind of a zoom in showing that you can see individual stars. And in this case, individual stellar clusters where we can count the stars within each stellar cluster, which means we can model these as simple stellar populations and fit color magnitude diagrams to these clusters within the Hubble galaxy or within, sorry, the Andromeda galaxy. And so we can do this Gaia-like study uh, using Hubble in a nearby uh, system. We don't have information on proper motions the way we get from Gaia, but what we do have is that everything is kind of at the same distance. You know, the galaxy is so far away that its thickness and the change in distance with respect to the observer is small compared to that overall distance. So with Gaia, we have excellent parallaxes. We know the, uh, we know everything. Uh, here, all of those biases that we worried about at the beginning are basically uniform. Everything's at the same distance. Uh, we see we're not looking through the edge of a galaxy. We're looking kind of top down onto it. So the extinction's less important. So it's a complementary way to do this to uh, Gaia. We just get a little less information, but it gets what we can, what counts, which is the um, we have good uh, mapping of these individual stars and can make color magnitude diagrams of the system. So what they do is they go through and they count up color magnitude diagrams. They do this analysis of how many stars are on the main sequence at different masses based on their uh, main sequence lifetime and stellar evolutionary timescales. And they map out 
the star formation history of the galaxy. And this is a little movie that shows this orientation. So this is basically, if you take the uh, uh, image in the top here and you kind of rotate it around uh, and so that it, it, you know, so it's sort of sitting at a kind of, you know, you basically rotate it at 135 degrees uh, clock, counterclockwise in the positive direction. Uh, you get this image. And the reason why they show it like that is this is what it actually looks like in RA deck coordinates. The other one is flipped over to make a pretty picture. Um, and this is a movie of the star formation history of Andromeda going through different slices of time. And what you're seeing is the local star formation rate historically uh, over time, looking back giggy years ago uh, through this particular analysis. And it's this amazing piece of galactic archaeology leveraging our knowledge of stellar populations and the uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And you can see some really cool little features here, which is uh, somewhere around this like three and a half giggy years ago, there's this ring that shows up. Uh, and so something in Andromeda triggers this big ring of star formation. And using this CMD analysis, we're able to actually build this up. Like, this is pretty cool. Yeah, we, we were looking back and seeing, oh, 3.5 billion years ago. Yeah, there's this burst of star formation in the system. Most of the star formation was happening uh, 11, uh, 11 giga years ago. So it's pretty high star formation rate. Then it kind of drops off uh, at this time period. Uh, five gig years ago. And then as recently as a gig year ago, 900 mega years, it's all the star formation is kind of happening outside uh, of this, uh, in the outside of this ring. And what this leads to this neat little analysis of asking, well, what's triggering all of these uh, star, formation, uh, star formation events? And seeing that star formation is not at local, is not kind of focused to a specific uh, part of the, uh, or, it's not happening everywhere within the galaxy. It's kind of focused in individual regions at different times. Now, I do want to sensitize you to one effect, which is if you look a long time ago, you don't see a lot of structure in this image versus what you see in these more recent uh, images. You're like, oh, those look like features in a galaxy or something. Since yeah, you know, this is star formation rate that was inferred for stars that are there now as they came from 11 billion years ago. But in 11 billion years, the galaxy has spun around something like 20 times. Uh, so the stars have kind of mixed around a lot and gone and orbited the center of the galaxy a lot. And so that's kind of scattered and smeared out a lot of their structure, their star formation structures. So we can't, you know, this isn't, you know, a true to form spatial map. This is for the stars in that popula in for the stars and that population now uh where where did they come from or how old were they and yeah we'll learn a little bit more about how things get smeared out dynamically like how orbits and stars sort of drift away from their birthplaces later uh but the summary of this is that we can make star from not we Ben Williams and Julianne Del Canton and a bunch of other amazing people at the University of Washington uh, can create the star formation histories of uh, galaxies using the techniques that we sort of laid out. And you can sort of map things out here where you see lots of star formation uh, at a long time ago. And then there's this sort of spikes that we were calling our attention to at different times. Note that the time bins uh, are big in the past and get smaller and smaller. And that's just because the time sequence, uh, you, you're just more sensitive to short, more recent star formation because those stars evolve quickly off the main sequence. The stuff that was 11 uh, gig years ago, we don't have as much leverage on because these are low mass stars. And so you have to kind of average over a lot of them to get a strong signal. All right. That was, uh, I, I just wanted to showcase how the techniques that we've been uh, sort of building up are applied in recent studies to kind of do this galactic archaeology. Are there any questions about that? Ah, SFH is the star formation history. It's the star formation rate over time.
Yeah, so often SFR will indicate the instantaneous star formation rate, which is the right now. All right. Last thing to talk about in stellar populations is this notion of uh, unresolved stellar populations. So we've focused on resolved cases where we can count individual stars, but then we can also just take spectra of lots and lots of stars and ask, well, what's the star formation history of that? And you can make this map where you have, you, you can do things that are slightly more parametric, which is basically you pick a model star formation history or star formation rate over time, and then ask, well, what's the emergent light for that? And compare that to uh, observations. And this showcases what happens if you have a constant star formation rate, where you basically form a stellar population a little bit uh, uh, at a time over the 14 billion year age of the universe, versus what happens happens if you exponentially decay away. You, so you form more stars in the past and then fewer stars now, uh, you get a different shape of the spectrum. Everything else is the same in this population, but we can use the properties of the light to infer how that um, happens how that kind of comes together. So I thought that, that, you know, this is neat and we apply this technique to infer star formation histories of galaxies more distant than the local group. And now as a sort of conclusion of this chapter, I thought it'd be worth kind of emphasizing everything that kind of, we, we now understand everything that's going into this kind of analysis, or at least we have covered it. I mean, I don't understand it, so I think it would be hard-pressed to say, oh, you understand this as well. It's probably, uh, uh, we have been exposed to uh, this, which is, um, you know, the sort of three ingredients to actually understand what the emergent light from a galaxy are, are in the stars, are the initial mass function, and we have different choices of initial mass functions, and this shows them here on the left-hand uh, figure. Uh, then we have to understand these isochrones, uh, which are basically, if I make a bunch of stars, where those stars are in their Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, uh, and to understand their intrinsic properties over time. That comes from stellar evolution models. And then we also have stellar spectra, and we've dwelled a little less on this here, but we do know that stars come in different spectral types, and their intrinsic properties, their luminosities and temperatures, set and metallicities, set their emergent spectra. So we can combine these three things to come up with the spectra or the distributions in the HR diagram of uh, a simple stellar population. We then have to combine that with the star formation history and something that we will talk about later, uh, the chemical evolution of the system. So the star formation history, uh, this uh, top graph here shows the star formation, uh, a couple models for star formation rate over time that you could uh, look at. And you say, oh, okay, there's this big burst early or it rises up over time and that'll give you different populations. And then also how do stars pollute the galaxy's gas with heavy metals here. Something that we've alluded to, but haven't really addressed uh, in full detail is dust. So we know that it attenuates or extinguishes the light uh, from stars. And then I have mentioned, and we will explore more in the next chapter, the idea that anything that it absorbs, it will re-radiate and give light out of the galaxy. And so if we take all of these ingredients, star formation history, the properties of dust, the simple stellar populations, and combine them over time, that can all filter in to what the emergent light of a galaxy is across the electromagnetic spectrum. And so there's tons of information that's going into these models, but I'll stress that there's also tons of information that we have in observations. And so we start to constrain all of these different properties. Uh, and that gives us a good sense of how we're able to figure out so much about galaxies just by making these observations here. All right. That's what I want to say about stellar populations. We're about to change gears into the best subject ever, which is the interstellar medium. Any questions on that? All right. The interstellar medium. So the ISM, as I'll call it, is basically everything in the galaxy that's not stars or dark matter. 
And uh, so you might think that, oh, okay, gas and dust, that's a reasonable thing to call interstellar matter. Uh, but then you call magnetic fields interstellar medium as well. And that you're just like, but not matter. It doesn't make sense. But it's kind of this catch-all bucket of where we put everything that we don't really say, oh, this is stars, this is dark matter. And uh, all of these, uh, the, the dominant component by mass in the interstellar medium is the gas. And so we focus a lot and describe the properties of the interstellar medium in terms of the gas. Uh, so whenever we see the interstellar medium, we'll often refer to its phase. And its phase is determined in terms of the chemical state of hydrogen and its temperature. And so hydrogen can come in three chemical states, uh, which is it can be ionized, it can be neutral, or it can be molecular. So ionized is protons and electrons separated, neutral is happy atoms, and then molecular is when I make a diatomic molecule by sticking two hydrogens together. And it's gonna be in one of these three states. We don't have a lot of choices about it. Hydrogen chemistry is fortunately now finished. We're done, that's everything hydrogens can do. Heck, throw in helium and we have completely covered chemistry because then helium doesn't react with anything since it's noble gas. And hey, we're 98% of the way done through chemistry, at least by mass. Um, so, uh, I will note, <coughs> excuse me, that we will often slip into a lingo that describes these states in terms of their spectroscopic notation. And spectroscopic notation is the, uh, refers to the chemical state of an atom through its elemental symbol, like H, and then a Roman numeral where one is the neutral state, two is the first ionized state, three is the second ionized state. And therefore, ionized hydrogen, first ionized state, is often called H2. So that's H-I-I, -I, as we've written. And then neutral hydrogen is called H1. And then molecular hydrogen is written, as you would normally in chemistry, as H2. So we often have the annoying feature of saying that there are H2 regions emerging in the H2 cloud and having those two things be different things. It completely makes sense if you write it down because there's different ways of writing two, but when you say it, it's completely reasonable to be like, uh, wait, which two is that? So feel free to ask if it's not clear as we go. It's a horrible convention, but at this point, uh, one of the main themes of the class is we are filled with horrible conventions. The phases of the interstellar medium, I kind of lay them out here uh, in a catalog. The thing that you should really focus on is uh, that we have these descriptors. Uh, their temperatures are hot, warm, cool, and cold, uh, where hot is a million Kelvin and cold is 10 Kelvin, and then warm is 10,000, just kind of in the middle. Then we have the chemical descriptors ionized, neutral, or molecular that we've already discussed. And this is, the again, the state of hydrogen. And then we also have densities here. And you'll notice that the densities run in the opposite direction from the temperatures. Uh, and this means that they, uh, if you look at each of those rows and you kind of add together the exponents, they all come out to be about 10 to the 8. And so what that means is the interstellar medium is in rough kind of pressure, what we call equipartition. It's not in equilibrium but it's everything is kind of balanced. And so the pressures are kind of you know, equal in magnitude between the phases of the ISM. So I wanna show you a quick movie here, not a quick movie, an amazing movie of the interstellar medium as seen through numerical simulation. So I'm gonna let it run for a little bit and then talk about it. What you're seeing here, uh, go away scroll bar, that's not what I need you to do. Hey, excellent. Uh, so what you can see here is a bunch of, this is a box of the galaxy in the interstellar medium in the galaxy. And the top panel here is showing you an edge on view. So the disk of the galaxy is in the middle. And then the bottom little squares are looking down on this rectangular prism that slices through the galaxy. And you can sort of see it uh, through different, uh, in, in different views. And there are different perspectives on this. So we first see the density. They show the mass density. Uh, the temperature in Kelvin, where uh, blue is cold and red is hot. The column density is just the integral of the density through the uh, plane. Uh, then you have the, uh, the amount of 
H plus, neutral hydrogen, and molecular hydrogen in different places. And then for reasons that we'll discuss a little later, we have the carbon monoxide tracer, which is how you actually trace the molecular medium. And so what this does is it shows you the kind of evolution of parts of the galaxy uh, in the different phases of the interstellar medium. And the thing that should sort of terrify you about this is that everything is moving and changing all of the time. And this is kind of the truth of the interstellar medium is it's a highly dynamic system and uh, we have all of these effects going on. And the reason why there's all these flashes and blasts and everything going off is that this is only showing you the gas what you're seeing is the effects of stars. So stars are forming in the system, undergoing supernova explosions and blasting things out. So we want to understand this piece of the interstellar medium by kind of studying uh, three, separate phase case, uh, three separate case studies of the physics of the interstellar medium that are important for understanding galaxy evolution. So we'll pick that up on... Wednesday, because I've gone a minute over. I'm sorry. Uh, I owe you 60 seconds. All right. I will catch you all later and have a lovely uh, 47 hours. Bye-bye.